All right, folks, so today I want to take a look at the Bitcoin white paper, which was published by the anonymous Satoshi Nakamoto back in 2008. I should note that this paper was not peer reviewed. It was published to a mailing list simply as a white paper. However, at this point, more than 10 years later, we can say that the ideas presented in this paper have met with a lot of verification out in the real world. The central goal of Bitcoin is to be able to allow online payments without needing a trusted third party. Currently, e-commerce relies a lot on trusted third parties, and these are usually financial institutions. Depending on these trusted third parties comes with a lot of drawbacks. First of all, we cannot have completely irreversible transactions because the financial institutions always have the power to reverse a transaction. This mediation increases transaction costs. It also means that you need some minimum practical transaction size and that this is not practical for small transactions. This also makes merchants suspicious of their customers, which leads them to asking a lot of information of their customers to get around all these problems with using trusted third parties. The goal of the Bitcoin system is to introduce a mechanism via which two parties can transact directly with each other, hence the name peer-to-peer, -peer, without needing a trusted third party. And the central result of this paper is a way to prevent double spending using a purely peer-to-peer -peer distributed protocol. Most of the cryptography presented in this paper was already well known at the time that this was written. I think the central contribution of this paper is bringing together all those techniques and stitching them into a system of incentives that makes it work. Let's look at how transactions would be represented in the system. A coin is simply a chain of digital signatures, and we can define a mechanism by which the owner of a coin can transfer the coin to another owner. And the way this would work is by forming a chain of digital signatures. Let's look at this example here. This block is owned by owner one and owner one wants to transfer this to owner two. The way he would do it is take this entire block and also take owner two's public key and hash it together. When you hash the two together, you are essentially linking owner two's public key to the previous block. The hash is then signed using owner one's private key. At this point, owner two can look at the signature and using owner one's public key, verify that it was indeed owner one who signed this. This is what was later referred to as the blockchain. This entire paper doesn't use the term blockchain at all. That was a term coined by other people after the publication of this paper. So that is a way to transfer coins from one owner to the other. However, we still crucially need to prove the absence of double spending. In the model where there was a trusted third party, that trusted third party was aware of all transactions and hence it could tell if a coin was being spent a second time. How would you do this in a purely peer-to-peer -peer fashion? The idea at a high level is to announce all transactions publicly and then create a mechanism for all participants to agree collectively on a history of all transactions. And if we have those two, then we can check that no coin has been spent more than once. So how do we do that? What the author proposes is using a timestamp server. We take the hash of a block to be timestamped and widely publish the hash. You could publish it on the net or in a newspaper. And each timestamp, just like in the previous mechanism of the blockchain, would include the previous timestamp in its hash, and this would form a chain. This means that each new timestamp verifies the ones before it. So you are reinforcing the timestamp of the blocks before you 
by building a chain on top of them. But how would we do that in a more practical manner? Publishing these hashes in a newspaper or on the internet or in newsletters posts is not exactly a very practical thing. To do that, the author proposes a mechanism called proof of work. We manufacture a problem that requires computational work to solve. In this particular case, the problem is to find a value that when hashed begins with a given number of zero bits. The work required to do this is exponential in the number of bits. It's very easy to verify it because given a block and the resulting hash, you can trivially hash the block and check if you get the resulting hash. But in order to hash something and get a given hash value, you have to do essentially an exhaustive search of the space. The way we do this is by using a nonce in the block. A nonce is the cryptographic term for a value that occurs only once. The computational problem becomes to take the entire previous block and to find a nonce such that the hash of the new block begins with a given number of zero bits. And finding a nonce to meet this condition takes a lot of computational work. And the nice property of this proof of work is that the only way to change the block is if you redo all the work to compute this hash. And as more and more blocks are chained, it becomes more and more implausible for someone to be able to recompute all these hashes and expand the enormous computational power in order to do that. This essentially gives every CPU participating in the Bitcoin network one vote. The longest chain has the greatest CPU work expended on it. And this gets us to the attack model for the Bitcoin protocol, which is that the network will continue to work if a majority of CPU power is controlled by honest nodes. And if that happens, the true chain or the honest chain will continue to grow the fastest. What would an attacker have to do to take over the network? An attacker would have to redo the proof of work of a given block and all the blocks after it in the blockchain. That would then let it catch up with the present block and then go past the work of the honest nodes to make a fake chain that is longer than the honest chain. Now, later in this paper, the author shows that the probability of that happening is very, very low. Let's put this all together to finally spell out how the network operates. We publicly announce all new transactions, and these are collected into blocks. Each node in the network works on finding a difficult proof of work of its block which is computing a hash with a nonce to get a given number of zero bits. Once it has done this, the node broadcasts this new hash along with its proof of work to all other nodes. And there is an acceptance protocol for a node to accept this newly published block, and it will accept it only if all transactions in it are valid and not already spent. So this is the crucial part which prevents double spending. And this cycle continues because the way nodes express their acceptance is by including the just announced block and linking it to the next block. The property we always want to maintain is that the longest chain is the correct one. The beauty of this entire system is that it sets up a set of incentives which propagate the robustness of the network. Once you bootstrap this protocol with the very first block in the blockchain, the incentive for other nodes is to propagate this network because that's how coins get distributed. New coins keep getting added as members of the network expand proof of work, just like gold miners expend energy to dig up gold. In this case, we're using CPU time and electricity to mine new coins. Interestingly, 
this also is an incentive to keep the entire network honest because if an attacker is able to subvert the network and the way they would do that is by controlling a majority of the cpu power in the network the attacker could do two things they could either go back and redo blocks and double spend their blocks or you could mine new bitcoins and the incentive is to not go back and just keep double spending but just to mine new bitcoins and to build more wealth that way now we quickly go into an implementation optimization which is that if we have a large number of blocks in the blockchain we probably don't want to store the entire history all the time and the way we can optimize this is by organizing our blockchain as a merkle tree what is a merkle tree it's very similar to the blockchain concept except that the blocks are organized in a tree structure rather than a list structure and when the blocks are organized like this in a tree structure where the hash of the parent is based on the hash of its children you could just save the hash of the root you don't need to save the hashes of all the children a quick back of the envelope calculation here even with transactions every 10 minutes the author arrives at the figure of only needing about four and a half megabytes per year which is very easily manageable you can see that even if you scale that by two or three or four orders of magnitude it would comfortably fit within a modern desktop or laptop computer now, is it possible for a participant in the network to verify a payment without running a full node as we described earlier? And you can do this. We need to simply get a copy of the longest chain, which we can do by asking all the other full nodes in the network and look at the branch linking the transaction we want to verify to the block in which it occurs. And the presence of this transaction in a block implies that the network had accepted it in the past. And all the blocks after it that were accepted by the network only reinforce the acceptance of that transaction. Now, this network can achieve a really high level of privacy because even though we publicly announce all transactions, we can simply choose to keep our public keys anonymous the network only depends on participants signing hashes with their private keys and other participants verifying those hashes with other people's public keys but there is nothing that actually links these keys to a specific person or entity now the author gets into a few calculations to see how likely it would be that an attacker can take over this network and we model this as a race between the honest chain and the attacker's chain because the network as specified will accept the longest chain as the true one. And we model it as a binomial random walk. And we wanna see what the probability is of an attacker catching up from a deficit by being a few blocks behind. So let's say P is the probability of an honest node finding the next block. Q is the probability of an attacker finding the next block. And QZ is the probability of the attacker catching up when they are Z blocks behind the head of the chain. So what will QZ be? If the attacker is stronger, then it will be one. Then the attacker will be able to defeat the network. If the honest part of the network is stronger, then the probability becomes this. We are assuming that the honest part of the network is stronger, which is the same thing as saying that the honest parties control greater than 50% of the compute power in the network. And we can then model this race as a Poisson distribution with the expected value of Z times Q over P. And this gives us an attacker's likelihood of catching up as exponentially decreasing with Z, the number of blocks that he is behind. For example, even with Q as high as 30%, remember that Q was the likelihood that the attacker is able to compute the next block. If the attacker is 10 blocks behind, their probability of succeeding drops to 4%. And you can see as they get further and further behind, the probability that they will ever catch up drops off exponentially. All right, so to conclude, 
in this white paper, Satoshi Nakamoto has presented a system for electronic transactions that do not rely on a trusted third party. It relies on a peer-to-peer -peer network that reinforces itself using proof of work and records a public history of all transactions to prevent double spending. The network is quite unstructured. Nodes can leave and join as they please. And proof of work essentially means that participants vote with their CPU power. So that was a look at the Bitcoin paper. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time.